Hello and welcome to LA Currents. I'm Anita Bennett and today we're talking about Council District 8. There are a lot of changes and new developments happening here and joining me now to discuss this is Councilman Marquise Harris Dawson. You represent this area. Thank you so much for joining us. It's good to be here. Thank you. Excellent. So the pandemic has severely affected a lot of folks in this community. Tell us uh, what's been the impact and what is being done to help people. Well, there's a range of things that need to be done to help people survive the pandemic and then recover from the pandemic. During the survival phase, the most important thing was to make sure our seniors were as protected as possible and that they didn't have to leave their houses. And so we implemented a program to pay our local restaurants that would have had to have closed otherwise to prepare meals for seniors. Uh, we got Uber and Lyft to hire drivers from our district to drive and deliver meals to folks. Uh, on a on a day-to-day -day basis. That's really interesting. Was it difficult to get Uber and Lyft on board? It was not difficult to get them on board. I think the moment that the pandemic started is one of those moments that we have ever so often where everybody's looking for how they can contribute, right? And for a little bit of time, people aren't looking about what they can do for themselves. They're thinking about what they can do for others. And so we picked up the phone and asked and everybody we asked responded favorably. Nice. What about vaccinations? What efforts have been uh, underway to help get more folks vaccinated? We, from the outset, we knew that there was going to be a gap, especially in the communities along the 110 freeway, hardest hit by uh, the pandemic in terms of infections, in terms of deaths. And also, they were, it was the area lagging in, in vaccinations. And so at clinics, at parks like the one we're in now, we made sure that vaccinations were available to the people in the community. So you could only get it if you had an address locally uh, here. And we were able to get thousands of people vaccinated that way and help close the gap in vaccinations. What about mobile vaccine? Doing sites. mobile vaccines in church parking lots, in at the corner, uh, you know, at the little mini mall that people go to. Uh, various stores have hosted us, churches have hosted us, community groups have hosted us. And so we go essentially where anybody, if they have the space and they have the willingness and desire, we uh, try to get a truck out there. Mm -hmm. And the county health department has said that these, these smaller uh, clinics and everything have really made a difference with black and brown folk. Well, that's definitely true. The big sites uh, are, feel a little bit imposing. When you go there, it's not people you know, either getting the vaccine or giving the vaccine. Uh, you know, there's a lot of official people there. And so our folks don't necessarily run to those types of places, but if it's in the church parking lot and they know someone that goes to that church, or if it's in the park and it's a park that they play in, uh, if it's at the local mini mall where they use the donut shop, those are places people feel comfortable and get the vaccine. That makes a lot of sense. So let's shift gears now and talk homelessness. It's probably one of the most discussed issues in the city. What is being done to address homelessness in your district? Well, ho homelessness is absolutely the first, second, third, and last issue in our city. If we can't solve the basic problem of making sure human beings can live indoors, uh, we've eff effectively failed as a society. And so our failure shows up in things like encampments. Uh, there can be an encampment in the alley behind your house or at the corner down the street from your house or, or blocking the sidewalk where you do your, your morning walk uh, because people have taken to living on the streets because frankly, that's the option that we've offered them. Uh, and so we've got to be very aggressive about building long-term housing and short-term housing. I know sometimes there's a debate about which one is more important. The fact of the matter is they're both important. We lose about eight or nine people every night who are living on the street that we wouldn't if they were just housed, even in a shelter in temporary housing. And so we are being very aggressive. Uh, we are well on our way to doing over uh, 1,500 affordable and homeless housing units in the 8th District. Uh, we're also a long, long way towards getting outreach teams that are in the encampments every day. So offering folks housing where we have housing available, making sure folks can get access to mental health services, reconnecting people with their family sometimes. Sometimes people need a way to get back to a town that they came here from uh, and where they have family and they can be more stable. And so uh, we're out every day in those encampments. And what you see is that slowly but surely, the size of those encampments goes down and the safety of them uh, improves until we can get everybody uh, under a roof every night of the week. And you mentioned, you know, getting folks back to where their families are. How is that done? Well, sometimes when you talk to people, this is the trick about homelessness. A lot of times it's treated as if homeless people have a disease. 
So uh, we all avoid them. Like if we see an encampment, we walk on the other side of the street. And so we try to avoid contact. Well, the outreach workers and sometimes our staff and sometimes I even get the opportunity to talk to somebody. And everybody's got a story. Everybody, you know, no one wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I think I'm going to go sleep out in a tent on, you know, one of the boulevards of Los Angeles. We all like to go camping, not on our streets. Um, and when you talk to people, you find out the various ways that they ended up in the position where they felt this was the only place they had to sleep. And sometimes they came to Los Angeles to tend to a sick relative or they came to Los Angeles for a specific reason. For a short amount of time, they get caught up in one thing or the, another and the next thing you know, they're struggling for housing. And once they're struggling for housing, then they're not saving to get back. And it's just a vicious cycle that entraps people a lot. And sometimes with a little bit of support, you can unlock that trap and free people to do what they need to do. So if someone wanted to go back to say Louisiana, does the city help them get a bus ticket? Or? The city sometimes helps them get a bus ticket. Sometimes neighborhood uh, block clubs or neighborhood councils will all pitch in, especially if it's a situation where we've had situations where the people in the block club actually know the person or they talk to them or they take them food or clothes or we have uh, one uh, person who will wash the clothes of the people in the encampment and through that process you get to know people and eventually people tell you their stories and sometimes their stories uh, open a window to a solution that that can be achieved. Another big issue in the city is public safety. What can we do to increase public safety? Well the first and most important thing around public safety is just the sheer number of guns on the streets. You know, the press really covered the run on toilet paper during the pandemic. What they didn't cover was the run on guns. More guns were sold in 2020 than in any year that they've been keeping track. And because of uh, we're organized by states in this country, we have very good gun laws in California. They don't have such great gun laws in Arizona or Nevada or nearby states. So people can just go across the border, come back with the weapons. And what happens is you have an increase in shootings everywhere. So we got to deal with guns and we got to press the federal government to do something about the, the widespread availability of guns. I mean, young people can get a gun quicker than they can get an automobile in this city. And so you got to change that. But in the meantime, what we do is make sure that our public safety resources are very close to the ground. So that means we want officers that know the community, the community knows them, that they're embedded in the community, that they have a relationship with the community. We want gang intervention workers who have a history in the community that have been here for generations and have connections and know where the fault lines are, know where disputes are likely to pop up and help manage those uh, disputes. And also we want to make sure there are things for our young people to do. And so we're sitting here next to a, a brand new pool. Let me circle back. Um, so you're talking about community-based policing. Yes. Okay. I'm talking about community-based policing. We have the community um, community safety partnership in Harvard, the Harvard Park area, but we're encouraging all of our, again, all of our public safety resources to be close to the ground. This idea that you're in some vehicle and you drive around, expecting that that you know just the presence of your car is going to create public safety, is true to some extent. It's much true to a, it's truer to a greater extent if you are actually having human, human, human to human contact with the people in the community. And you mentioned uh, we are actually in a park. You yeah, mentioned this we're park. In the poor, we're in a park. Uh, parks are very important to us. We view our parks as ground zero for public safety efforts. It's where you can bring young people. It's where you can bring families. It's where we can be community. This pool was about to close, and so uh, myself and the council and the mayor intervened, and so it's open. We had it open for summer last year, but of course there was no swimming, so we're excited. Uh, that in just a few weeks we're going to open it up and it'll be full of uh, young people swimming from you know the break of dawn all the way until the sun goes down. Wow, what's been the reaction from the community about this park? The community is ecstatic. I think there have been a few kids who figured out how to jump the fence and test it out to make sure it's okay for everybody else. Uh, but I think, you know, the excitement is bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm. And parks, you know, help keep kids off the streets, correct? That's right. It keeps kids occupied. It keeps them relationships with each other. And then when there are disputes, because young people, like adults, you're going to get into disputes. And so young people different than older uh, folks can be taught the process to settle a dispute that doesn't include violence. And you can learn that in a park, whether it's in your soccer league or in your little league baseball or your basketball league or the dance class or in the pool.
Part of this park uh, was dedicated to a young woman who was killed right before the LA riots. Can you can you talk to me about so that? So Latasha Harlins tragically lost her life at Empire Liquor in 1991. Uh, this is the park that Latasha Harlins played in, and so recently, Reckon Parks, in cooperation with Latasha Harlins' family and Netflix, rebuilt the park completely, the playground completely, and we renamed the playground the Latasha Harlins Playground here at Algin Sutton Park. And I have to say, the playground is lovely, um, and there was more corporate support to revitalize this park besides Netflix, correct? Yes, the uh, Dodgers, uh, Clayton Kershaw and, and Yasuo El Puig's foundations uh, donated money, Dodgers Dream Field. So we have two Dodgers Dream Fields, one for girls, one for boys. We have a soccer field that was uh, provided to us by the California Endowment and the Los Angeles Galaxy uh, soccer team that plays just down the road. Um, and a host of other supporters have come in to make sure we can get the, get the gap to where we need it to be. Uh, this is a busy area. We're right by LAX. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about public safety. There is a rash, of, or there has been a rash, of uh, hit-and-run crashes. What, what can the city do? Well, the hit-and-run crashes, again, I always say there's what the city can do, but there's what drivers can do. Drivers need to appreciate how much damage you can do when you're in your car, and you need to be conscious of it. Now we all have phones, so two things are happening. The, the drivers are looking at the phone, and the pedestrians are looking at their phone <laughs> so no one's paying attention to what's happening on the road uh, and so uh, we need your eyeballs on the road if you're a pedestrian if you're a bike rider if you're definitely if you're in your car please keep your eyes on the road as much as possible that's the best and most effective way to deal with uh, the the accidents that we see on our roads but the other thing we can do is do some road diets we have some streets that and again this is not so popular we have some streets that people just drive too fast on you know, Broadway uh, Boulevard, we're, we're close to right now. We clock people at 70, 75 miles per hour, and it's a street that has at least some residential on it, not to mention uh, a lot of commercial. And it's just too fast for people to be going on a surface street. So we need to make those lanes a little thinner, you know, put a few turns in it so that people have to, one, be conscious of what they're doing and uh, uh, be safer about what they're doing. Are there any resolutions on the books to address that? There are lots. So we have several of our intersections are funded um, uh, through the, the public safety initiative that we have at, at, in the city called Vision Zero. So the idea is that there would be zero deaths, uh, pedestrian or bicycle deaths on our roads. And what they do is they re-engineer the streets that essentially in a way that cause you to drive in a more careful and in a slower way. Let's shift gears. You helped introduce a resolution to support the federal George Floyd Act. Tell us why you did that and what it's about. We did that because uh, we thought we wanted Los Angeles to be uh, one of the loudest in the chorus, demanding that Washington implement police reform. Uh, a lot of the reforms in the George Floyd uh, bill uh, have already been done here in Los Angeles, so there's nothing controversial for us per se, but we understand it's controversial for the nation because when you're a citizen and you go across this line or that line, a cop is a cop is a cop, and it hurts LAPD officers if officers down the road or in another state uh, behave in a, in a way that causes a decay in trust of law enforcement. Our officers end up dealing with that, whether they're the ones who did it or not, and so, you know, we got... Uh, um, 18,000 police departments in the United States. Most of them have less than 10 officers. And most of them, frankly, have very low, if, if any, standards at all, especially when you compare them to Los Angeles. This creates a national standard, and it creates a national registry of police officers so that if you messed up in Missouri, you can't go to Texas and become an officer as if nothing happened. And so all those things we think are super, super important uh, to build the kind of fabric and relationship between police and the community that's needed. Mm -hmm. So the resolution is essentially to voice support for, for that uh, bill. Okay. And to ask our members of Congress that represent Los Angeles to make sure that they support that bill. Excellent. Um, are there any new developments, new projects happening in this district that you're excited about? There, there, you know, there's so many to count. There are too many to count. So we've got Destination Crenshaw along the Crenshaw line. It's a hundred million dollar outdoor uh, museum dedicated to the story of African Americans in Los Angeles and the West. Uh, we have this new pool and another new pool at Van Ness Park uh, representing an almost $50 million investment just in aquatics uh, facilities here in 
the 8th uh, uh, Council District. We've got the Western Beautiful Project, an $11 million renovation of the Western uh, streetscape. Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall, the, the, the subject of much discussion, sometimes heated discussion, it will be developed. It will be developed in our image for us uh, and for uh, the future of our community. And so there are really so many to count um, that I'm, I'm sure I left out a really, really important one. Uh, but the point is uh, the district is on the move. Okay. Um, parts of South LA are food deserts. Uh, so what can we do to overcome this issue? Well, you know, the food desert issue is really a corporate creation. I don't even like calling them food deserts. I like calling them food apartheid. Deserts are something that just happened in the nature. You go a place and it's a desert. Apartheid is something human beings do. These corporations decide that some people they want to give, you know, provide groceries to and other people they don't. And all too often it's the people in our community. And so I think we have to challenge those corporations directly. I have several motions before the city council to do that. Uh, I think that's the first order of the business. The second thing is we've got to support our small operators. And again, I know it's really convenient to go into a full service grocery store, but we have convenience stores that serve you know, organic vegetables and fruit and dairy and uh, lots of pro products that you need to live they may not be what, exactly what you like, but it, they have the products to help you live a healthy life. And so we got to support those vendors and make sure that they're, they're, they are, uh, they're successful. Also, the other big thing is education, because I think, uh, the, again, I lay a lot of this at the feet of the corporations. They guide us down a path that works against our interests, right? And so they make uh, very available, the least healthy things are the most available things. And the most healthy things are the least available things. And so I can go get something full of sodium, full of fat, full of carbohydrates in an instant. But if I want to find something that's whole grain, or if I want to find something that's low fat, or I want to find something that's high in fiber, that's hard. And the corporations in this country, corporations are responsible for distributing food. The government doesn't do that. Like we don't, we don't have a government food service. We turn that over to corporations. And so since we've given that responsibility to them and allowed them to keep all of the profits that come from it, we've got to hold their feet to fire to make sure they do it in a fair and just way. Mm -hmm. And you talked about some of the smaller vendors. How have they weathered the pandemic? You know, they've mostly done good. They found ways to provide services to the community even during the pandemic. Uh, most of them have really stepped up their ability to have delivery door-to-door uh, -door delivery and so that's opened up a whole new market for them so people maybe that wouldn't have even shot with them before if they can get the products brought to them they will use those stores and so we're finding a lot of our businesses are poised to do even better after the pandemic than they did before that is good to hear it's very exciting yeah can you talk a little bit about reimagine funds the reimagine funds are funds that uh, in the summer of 2020 we decided that we uh, every year whether crime goes down or crime goes up one thing the L.A. City Mayor and Council does for sure is give more money to the police department than they gave the year before. And so last year we said, you know what, we're going to try it a year that we don't do that. We're going to invest that extra money in things that build up the community and community-based safety initiatives. So that those funds have gone to fund everything from gang intervention worker, workers in our parks to services to help talk to young women who are being trafficked to get them off of the street. Uh, and out of, uh, out of being trafficked and in, into prostitution. We've spent some of that money to build up some community centers and buildings that could be used by the public but haven't because they've been in disrepair. So there's just a host of things that we're doing that are very, very exciting with the reimagined funds. My colleague, Kern Price, uh, pioneered the uh, guaranteed basic income. So there'll be a lottery and a certain, certain citizens who live in certain low-income areas will be provided with income so that their income has a floor and we want to see what happens after a certain amount of time are they able to get better jobs are they able to fix up their housing do their kids do better in school we'll keep track of all that to see whether or not income supports in fact can solve a lot of the problems that we've tried other ways to solve in the city can you put a dollar amount on some of these reimagined funds the reimagined funds total 153 million we used about 40 million of it so that we could stop furloughs during uh, the pandemic because the budget was so low. And then the other, uh, 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 another 10 million went to the mayor's youth uh, summer employment program, which was a little bit tricky because we didn't have, end up having any summer employment. So that money is still there. And then the other, mil, mil, uh, the other uh, 90 million got divided between council districts and they each had projects that they had, that were either underfunded or not funded or they wanted to test out. Mm -hmm. 
The summer jobs uh, program is very popular. Is it coming back this year? It is absolutely coming back. It'll come back with a vengeance. Uh, this is going to be a great summer for the young people of Los Angeles. We expect their parks are going to be fully staffed. We want to get all these pools open. There's going to be a full set of activities from Little League to to dance to all of it that you see in the park. Uh, we want this to be like the golden era. When I was a kid and many, many of the members of the council who grew up in this town, when I was a kid in the summer, you could just walk to your local park or a local LAUSD campus. You didn't have to be a student, you didn't have to show a card. There were adults there. If you wanted to learn to play sports, you could do that. There were classes you could take. There were tournaments you could join. Uh, we want that type of environment back in Los Angeles for every young people that, that live uh, you know, from, from the top of Granada Hills all the way to the tip of San Pedro. And what are people in the community saying about the reimagined funds, the summer jobs? Well, I think there's a good deal of excitement, but there's also a good deal of skepticism because for so many years, people are saying, oh, we need to fund these activities and we need to fund these things. And now we're saying we're going to fund them, but they haven't hit yet because the parks are closed. We're in the pandemic. And so I think people are anxiously and guardedly waiting uh, to see what happens. Well, how do we convince those folks this is a good thing? Well, I just say wait and see. I, you know, the, look, uh, this is, uh, my community is all about show and prove. Uh, they don't want to hear me talking about it. They want to see it happening. And so we're just eager to get it going. All right. Is there anything else you're excited about in, in this district? We're, there's so much to be excited about it in, in the, the district, but what we're most excited about is I feel like we're really close to having a breakthrough citywide that's really going to help us deal with homelessness, that's going to help move people off the street into shelter and into housing uh, on a nightly basis. And we're going to change this situation where we have come to expect as a regular course of business that our neighbors sleep outside at night. How closely is the city working with homeless advocacy groups? We work very closely with homeless advocacy, advocacy groups. It, for example, my office, we have outreach workers in our district office every day. We are uh, visiting the encampments with uh, the outreach workers on a daily basis. We're working with sanitation. We work with the housing providers uh, to make sure that the minute they have a vacancy, we have someone else to move in there. And so there's pretty vigorous interactions. Uh, with the homeless community and we get to get an anatomy of the encampments which helps us move them to resolution much quicker. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the encampments that are say close to where people live, work and play, what is the community saying? Oh the community is absolutely irate. Uh, they, people do not you know, no one buys a house and says, oh, I want to have a campsite in the, you know, in my backyard or, or at my uh, front gate. And so people are understandably irate. People, you know, are not hostile towards homeless people and they don't blame homeless people, but they do feel like the government has a responsibility to do something about it. And, you know, they hold our feet to the fire as they should. Is homelessness also a public safety issue? Homelessness is a public safety issue. It's a public health issue. But greater than both of those, it's a moral issue. History's going to judge us. You, me, everybody. Oh, you were around when people were sleeping in the streets in Los Angeles and you lived there. What did you do? And we're all going to have to give an account for that. So what about entertainment? Everyone loves to have fun. Any new projects coming to this area? Well, we're very excited because culture is so important to our district. We're very excited about Destination Crenshaw, which is really a cultural streetscape experience that will feature both fine art at the highest level of artists from uh, this community that are known all over the world. Uh, it will also feature performance venues so that local artists have a way of doing performances in the community in a way that everybody uh, can access and in a way that's organized. It's really uh, tragic, I feel, that this part of the city is so much a driver of what is the entertainment capital of the world, the city of Los Angeles. Really, a lot of that fuel comes from this community, but our community doesn't benefit from it. And so Destination Crenshaw seeks to reverse that. And so it says, if you want to hear the music, if you want to consume the artwork, if you want to be entertained, you got to come to the place that birthed and nurtured that entertainment. And so whether it's Issa Rae and, and her television show, or Ava DuVernay or Kendrick Lamar, or whatever it is, it really comes from the heart of the black community of Los Angeles, and we want you to be able to consume it in the heart of the black community of Los Angeles. Councilman Marquise Harris Dawson, thank you so much for joining us to discuss issues important to CD8, including homelessness and public safety. And I'm Anita Bennett. This is LA Currents, and thank you for watching.